from our, from our last lessons. That Jesus is walking along the bridges. That's right. Coming the last of the eager of the bridges. He is. And so these churches were sent um, to Laodicea. Before we get started, though, I want to, um, from some, I'm sorry, from Ephesus to Laodicea. So I have given you all a handout that I want you to look at, and Jill has it on the screen. So if you look across the top, let's go across the top. You'll see the name of the church, the first column, second columns, the approximate dates. Now, it's it's hard to set dates around this because it doesn't, it, it, it's just more the time periods than, than actual dates. But these time periods or these, these time periods around these dates do fit with what's going on within each of the churches. So we have an approximate date. We have the meaning. The churches have a, have a meaning. So we look at the main feature of the, the time period. Jesus gives them each a name. He gives them a condemnation. He gives them a reproof, counsel, and a reward. So you're going to want to keep this next to you as we go through the seven churches. All right? Because you'll want to refer to that as, as we go through this. So we can go on to slide number three. Okay. Most of what you have in your handouts, uh, you won't need tonight because everything's going to be on the screen. So if you guys will just pay attention to the screen tonight, you'll be in really good shape. So what we know about the seven churches is they were sent to the Christian congregations located in the city of the Roman province of Asia at the end of the first century. Now, when he sent them these letters, these messages, what was the message that was sent? A scroll. A scroll, but what was what was contained within the messages? The letter is the book of Revelation. He sent him the whole book of Revelation. So even though there was a message to each church, the whole book of Revelation was sent to these people so they could see what would happen through time. And that's important for us to keep in mind. It wasn't that he just sent them chapters two and three. He, he sent all, was it 22 chapters in Revelation? Yeah. He sent all 22 chapters. So we want to keep that in mind so that each time period knew what was going to happen during their period, before, after. They put the picture on so there. So they, they would be yeah. aware. I took it off. And he sent them to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now, what do we know? Were there only seven churches in Asia Minor? No. No. We know that Paul literally started about 20 churches. But these churches were the ones that God picked. And I think as we go through, and we go through each one of these churches over the next two weeks, you'll understand why. Because these, these churches uh, were very strategically located. They were centers where there were large numbers of people, where a lot of people traveled to and from. And so they were churches that were in, had a lot of, of comings and goings. So a lot of people had the opportunity to learn to know Christ just by coming to the city. So um, included in, in those are their symbolic significance. Seven, remember, is the number of what? Completion or fullness, right. This indicates they are represented the entire Christian church. Their contents may be applied on three levels. So, uh, and we'll get to those those levels here in, in just a second. But we want to look first at the, the levels. First is the historical application. So these seven churches were located in important, prosperous 
city centers located on main postal road uh, that connected them. Under Roman government, they were generally enjoyed peace and prosperity. As a token of their gratitude and loyalty to Rome, a number of cities set up emperor worship in their temples. All of these cities had temples that uh, were pagan temples. So as you can imagine, if there were pagan temples and there was emperor worship, how did the Christians feel about emperor worship? Oh, right, it, it's against God, isn't it? So because it was compulsory, as well as the duty of all citizens, the citizens were expected to be involved in city, the city's public events and participate in pagan religious ceremonies. <clears throat> so we have this, we see this historical application continued here. Commissioned by Christ, John wrote the churches as their pastor to help them with the challenges of their pagan environment. It is thus primarily important to discover how these messages apply to the Christians in Asia to whom they were originally sent. So that's the historical application. Then there's a universal application. Pastor Jill covered Revelation. Yeah, and you, if you can, yeah, we're going this through the book. So you can, you guys that. can go through the book as well. Like I told Barbara. So we see here just as Paul wrote his epistles primarily to the churches of his day, they still contain timeless messages for subsequent generations of Christians. Similarly, the messages to the seven churches contain valuable lessons that apply to all Christian time periods. So just because it was focused on one period didn't mean it could not apply to all periods. And as, as we go through this, I think that'll become more clear as well. They were sent in one letter. The entire letter was to be read by all the churches. Since each message concludes with an exhortation to heed what the Spirit says to the churches, each message applies equally to all churches. Although each was written to an individual church, these messages speak to all Christians and can generally represent different types of Christians in certain periods of history or different in different locations. For instance, while the general characteristics of today's Christianity is essentially Laodicean, some churches or individual Christians might instead have characteristics of, of the church of Ephesus or Smyrna. So let's look at Revelation here, one eleven. Saying that's not, we need to go to the next. Are you frozen? Must be. Excuse me, one moment. So anyway, I'm going to read Revelation 1 1 to you. You may have that actually in your 111. It's on the top of the. Okay, good. The very top. Okay saying the alpha and the omega the first and the last what you see write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in asia so we see that it's going to ephesus smyrna pergamos thyatira sardis philadelphia and laodicea the spiritual condition of the seven churches correspond remarkably to the spiritual conditions of christianity in different periods He's repeating this again. All of it shows that the seven messages are intended to provide from heaven's perspective, a panoramic survey of the Christianity from first century until the end. As we look at these messages one by one, we will first explore the cities in which the seven churches were located to see how pagan practices affected the Christians there. 
Then we will take a closer look at each message to discover the valuable lessons they provided for the Christians in John's day as well as today. So if we look at the prophetic application, we see that each message has the following format. And if you look at your at, at, at the um, chart, thank you, that I handed out, we see that there's an address, an introduction of Jesus, Jesus' appraisal of the church, Jesus' counsel, and warning to the church, the appeal to hear the spirit, the promises to overcomers. So we're going to, and these, these messages all have the same parallels. So if you look at actually this last six on these, were the same six that we talked about here. So you will, you will see that. Now, if we take a look at the map of, and there's Jesus walking in the candlesticks, but if we take a look at the map, we've looked at the map before, but I want you to see how closely together these churches are. They're not that far apart, but yet they were big centers. Patmos is here. Ephesus, Smyrna. So Ephesus was the closest to Patmos, and it's the first church. And so the churches go in sequence. They go from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamon to Thyatira to Cyrus. So they, they all, the way they're lined up is the same way that God is sending letters to the churches. So God is God of organization, and we need to read up. And so it's as he- like seven too, if you look at it this way. Yes. The number seven. Yeah. Oh, it does look like the number seven if you turn it sideways. <laughs> See? So if you'll turn to the next slide, the next one. So this was F, this was a, an old time shot, of current, like a current shot of old time Ephesus. So I want us to read about Ephesus. And the, can I get a reader who will read loud for me the next two slides? I'll read. Okay. So Revelation 2, 1 through 7. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove the lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So, yeah, those, are, those are interesting statements, aren't they? So let's take some time here and unpack this. So what we know about Ephesus is that it was the capital city of the province of Asia. It was the fourth largest city in Rome and had had a population of nearly a quarter of a million. So that's 250,000 people, isn't it? So that was, that was a fairly well-populated city. It was located on the Aegean Sea at the mouth of the Castor River. So this was a port city, wasn't it? Yes. It was on a river. And, and so it was a port city. So it got a lot of traffic mm -hmm. through this city. <laughs> and it was at the roads of two major trade roads. This cosmopolitan city was known as the gateway to Asia. And so it had many, many people from all over the world coming to this, to this city. It was famous politically, commercially, and it was a religious center. It was filled with public and commercial buildings, including temples, theaters, gymnasium, bathhouses, and brothels. They had everything. It was a modern day town for all intents and purposes. <clears throat> the city was the home of the Pannonian Games. 
So that would be like the kind of like Olympic Games. Yeah, but for Asia. Yeah, for Asia. The city was the home. Oh, I said that already. These annual athletic events drew the whole population of Asia, of Asia to Ephesus. So every year they had just about everybody who loves sports and how many people love sports? Mm -hmm. Just about everybody. Mm -hmm. So no wonder God wanted this to be one of his churches. In the city, there were two temples devoted to the worship of the emperor. Mm -hmm. In addition, about 15 temples of different deities have been identified in this first century city. Ephesus was almost so famous for magical practices and arts. <clears throat> so we see an example of this in Acts 19.19. 19. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it was a total of 50,000 pieces of silver. So this, is, this happened when Paul was actually in Ephesus. Well, that this happened, that they brought all the, the, the early Christian brought their books and burnt them. By so you think that value of a piece of silver was your wage for the day. So think of 50,000 days worth of work of money. That's how millions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, but the, the point is there was a lot of, of mystical uh, practices going on there. The city's the pride city. was the grandeur of the temple Artemis or Diana to the Romans, considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it attracted multitudes of pilgrims each year for the annual Artemis festivals. So not only did they have big games, then they had these big pagan festivals where people came from all, all over the, the, the area. A great silversmith business was associated with the temple contributing to the city's wealth. The temple was at the same time a treasury house and a refuge for fleeing criminals, which is kind of interesting. Right. It also, that means they had a fair amount of, of problems going on with, there were a lot of criminals in the area you would have within the city, a, a high amount of, of issues going on. It also played a vital role in community life. The city was, however, notorious for immorality and superstition. It was viewed as full of criminals. It was the city that was most influential Christian city, Christian church in the province in which it was located. Established by Paul during his three-year ministry there, the church grew rapidly and soon became an important center in, the, in early Christianity. And if you want to read more about that, look at Acts 19. And you can go through and read that chapter at, at your leisure. So was it Paul established his church? Actually? Yeah, Paul actually was in Ephesus for three years, growing this church. Isn't it like John also the world pastor for this church? John was in Ephesus as well. Later. At a different time. So Paul's first. In fact, they think John died in Ephesus. Right. So you know, it was Paul. that's that's a great description of the city. Um, you know, in 2002, I had the privilege of being in that city and actually going through the ruins. And one of the important aspects of Africa was its education and library. That library in Ephesus was a center of learning. So this became really a center of not only religion, but philosophy, and everything else that went through there. There, there, there were a lot. Yeah. Each of these churches had had major libraries, right. and, and we're going to talk about this too. Uh -huh. So when Revelation was written, the church was still strong in the faith and had preserved the purity of the gospel. The city was most likely the residence of John prior to his exile. Mm -hmm. So he he was there before exile and. They believe he came back home there to die. The city was, however, notorious again for quality and superstition. We talked about that. It was viewed, he likes to talk about the criminals that were there. <laughs> it was in the city that the most influential Christian church in the province was located and established by Paul. I think I read this one already. I was uh, 19 after Okay. At the bottom, at the time Revelation was written. Yeah. We didn't read that. 
as a prior evaluation was made. Are we on 20? We're right there. Okay, okay. Let's, let's move to 20. The, the Christians living in Ephesus experienced all kinds of pressure from the pagans. This included opposition from pagans and accusations of their refusal to participate in pagan religious activities. So this is kind of interesting what they were accused of. They were accused of, of being atheists because they didn't participate in the emperor worship and, would, and the worship of the pagan gods. They were charged with cannibalism and the connection with the Lord's Supper. Stories that accused Christians of sacrificing children at their services and eating their flesh and drinking their blood were circulated. Because of this, Christians faced losing legal status in the city and suffering social isolation and potential persecution. So amazingly, then, the Christianity still survived. Yeah. And all the, it was very strong magic yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Jesus presented himself to the church in Ephesus as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden lampstands, which denotes his presence in the church for his knowledge of its situation and needs. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, he, these things says he who holds the seven stars. What do we, what do stars represent? Uh, angel. Angels. In case you, in case you get stuck, you have this is a second handout you're going to want to hang on to, which tells us what things mean. So you've got you've got that meaning as well. So angels in his right hand who walks in the midst of the candlesticks, and when we think about these lampstands. What do we think of with what what does the what does the lamp what did the, the candlesticks in the temple represent? Light. I remember a light. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Cool. And it was in where? In the temple. Where in the temple? The holy place. The holy place. In the holy place. Yeah. So remember many of you growing up. Danielle said she helped me with this. Um, but as, as little children, there was a song that we used to sing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. So remember, this is when, when you read this scripture, this is what it's talking about. We're not going to be hiding our light under the bushel, right? We're going to share it with the world. And that's what Ephesus was doing. So I guess each lampstand, that's why it's a church, because it's a, a, a source of light to the surrounding where it is. Yeah. 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 It's, we're, we're to be a guiding, a guiding light. In fact, these first hundred years, they're about this first century of Ephesus, the, the gospel pretty much went to the then known world. Amen. In that whole area around, people knew about Christ. Now, when you think of, you look at, at Ephesus with 200,000 people, and we'll look at similar populations in each of these other churches, that means the Christians and the Holy Spirit were really busy, weren't they? doing a huge work. They also stood firm in the face of persecution, despite pressure from outside. They had not grown weary. The church was doctrinally sound, exercised discernment in te testing false apostles, and did not tolerate their false teachings. And we see that in verses two and three, where it says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. What does patience mean? Perseverance, waiting. Yeah, it's it's being able to wait without getting frustrated, getting upset, or getting discouraged. How hard is that to do? So God knew that this church had patience, that you can bear those who you cannot bear those who are evil. They didn't put up with any nonsense around this evil evilness. And they have tested <clears throat> that say that are possible or not. Yeah. Yeah. Up to the bottom of it. Yeah. Yeah. 
how long it lasts. Best move, yeah. So we also know that Paul warned <clears throat> Ephesus about um, this issue with uh, wolves coming in and destroying God's people. In Acts 2.29, it says, the Ephesian elders exhorted, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. <clears throat> so Paul warned the Ephesians that there would be these false teachers that came in. And this false teaching is not just for the Ephesians, because if you look in the Bible, in Revelation alone, it talks about deception five different times, about being deceived by false teachers, and 36 times in the New Testament. So <clears throat> when Christ was here and the early disciples, they were constantly uh, um, warning them against these these false prophets. And, and this message is valid to us now. Yeah. To the false teaching. Say, I'm sorry, say that again. With the false teaching, we should be deceived by it now. We can be deceived by so it. So this is, this is Christ. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, we're listening to a sermon and, and heard somebody say something about it. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> one of the one of the things that false teachers do to just just so they just for us to be aware of is they will tell you a lot of truth, but they will slip in errors every here and there. And that that's one of the reasons we need to know our Bibles is so that we can be aware when we're being taught falsehoods. So we can we can see that too. So Paul says in, in Revelation 2, 4, and 5, what that he what he has against them. He says, what I have against you is I you have lost your first love. Now, I had to think about this one for a little bit, and we're going to unpack it a little bit more. But first loves usually don't last forever, do they? Those of you who are married or had friends or girlfriends, boyfriends, spouses, whatever, there's that initial period where there's just this energy. In fact, baby Christians are the most fun because they, they're so excited about God and they want to share it with everyone. But then as time goes on, that love kind of wanes, doesn't it? Sadly, it wanes. And so this was what was happening with the first century church. They were losing their first love. And he says in verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do your first works. So catch that fire again. Get out and share me with the world. Or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand. From its place unless you repent. <clears throat> and he talks in verse 6 about, um, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So we're gonna we're gonna unpack this one again. First of all, let's go back to this love, this first love issue. If you look at the book of Ephesians, and I put a little chart together here, if you look at the gospel. You look at, at grace through faith. That's in chapter two. So Paul, when he's telling them that this, basically all of Ephesians is telling them how they need to live and maintain a relationship with God. He's trying to warn them how to not lose their first love. So um, first of all, uh, it's, it is grace through Christ. And secondly, he talks about in the second half of the chapter, he talks about being one with Christ. In, in chapter 3, the mystery of the gospel. In the second half of chapter 3, prayer for spiritual strength. He talks about, in, in verse 4, the unity of the body and the new life. In chapter 5, he talks about walking in love and, and how to love your wives and husbands. In chapter 6, he talks about parents and children and how to, how to deal with your bond servants and maid servants. And then in chapter six, he teaches us to put all the, on the whole armor of God. So if you sit and read the book of Ephesians, 
Paul is teaching the church of, of Ephesus how to maintain that first love with Christ. And so if we feel in our life that we're losing that first love, it's worth going back and spending time uh, in the book of Ephesus. So despite these great qualities, this hardworking and faithful church had a serious flaw. It was backsliding in love. In their early days, the Christians in Ephesus were known for their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for all saints. We see in Ephesians 1.15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love to all saints, now, several decades later, that love was fading. In putting all the emphasis on right actions and sound doctrine, the members were declining in their love for Christ, and as a result, their love was fading for each other. Their religion became legalistic and loveless. So they were just going through the motions, weren't they? They were showing up for church, sitting in the pew, getting up, and going home and doing their week's labor. They had lost that desire to really go out and share God. Doing with what? Just doing what if you doing want. what was like right, but their church. lives became cold, but lacking love for Christ out and their fellow out. humans. Or even so God says, you have to get this back or I'm going to move, remove the lamps to them. The situation of the church in Ephesus reflects the situation in Israel just before the exile which in the words of Jeremiah, lost their ardent really? love and devotion Pardon it had for God during the early days. Jeremiah 2.2 yes. 2 says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus Thank saith the Lord, lesson. I remember thee, I try to the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, or wife, if you will. When thou went after me in the wilderness and in the land that was sown, so we see the same thing ha that happened to the Israelites. When they first came out of Egypt, there was a fervor. They were excited. They were ready to go into the promised land. <clears throat> and when they got to the promised land, they were excited. But over time, they completely lost that love for God that they had then. So the people of Israel were appointed to be God's light-bearing witness to the world. However, in their later history, they renounced their love for God, mistreating and oppressing their fellow humans, as well as <clears throat> losing their love for God. As a result, God took the privileges from being his light, bearing people from them. A similar punishment could happen yeah, to the church of Ephesus. Oh, if that, the very yeah. church does not reflect the love of God, it loses the very reason for existence. Yeah, yeah. It yes. is in danger of having its lampstand removed from its place, similar to how ancient Israel so also lost its privilege. Like, so okay? this was this was a dire warning mm -hmm. to the church. Okay. Yeah, it was a big warning to the church. I didn't get a response. So, um, I so this issue. I, yeah. I, I'm looking at that, and honestly, you believe that you're reading the same thing. Because people saw a lot of people. Please mute yourself if you're watching on yeah. Zoom. Yeah. And it's sad to Thank see you. that. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it's amazing. We're leaving right now. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, find, we'll find components of each of the churches in today's time. We will see that as we go through. And now, remember 12.6, we talked about the issue with the Nicolaitans. God says, I hate the Nicolaitans. That's a strong term, isn't it? I hate the Nicolaitans. It's not clear exactly who these people were. Some... Early Christian authors described them as heretical followers of Nicholas of Antioch, one of the seven deacons in the, of the Church of Jerusalem who ultimately fell into heresy. They advocated compromise and conformity with pagan practices to avoid the discomforting hardships of social isolation and impending persecution. The Nicolaitans are also mentioned in the Church of Pergamum, in which they were linked to other heretical groups. The followers were the teachings of Balaam. And we're gonna get, we're gonna look at that a little bit deeper. Revelation 2, 14 and 15 says, 
But I have a few things against you because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. The Nicolaitans have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. So we're gonna look at a couple of, of documents here, or a couple of, um, of um, brief, well, brief from, from different documents, some brief thoughts about the uh, Nicolaitan beliefs. The beliefs of the Nicolaitans comes from the interpretation of grace of God that was preached by the word of God. They misused the grace of God and liberty of Christ to fulfill their carnal lusts and desires. This comes from a, uh, an article called Salt of the Earth. The Nicolaitans believed and said that a person who is saved by grace is saved by grace. Therefore, it doesn't matter how they live. Is that a doctrine we hear today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love the Lord. I'm saved by grace. So he forgives me. It doesn't matter how I live. The Nicolaitans said that by faith in Jesus Christ, the spirit of a person is saved. But since they're bound by the flesh in which evil is present, you will always remain a sinner and always keep sinning. You serve God through your spirit, but you keep serving your flesh and its lust and desires during your life on earth. That sounds Gnostic. It is. It is somewhat Gnostic. We'll get into Gnosticism here in a second. The sins, uh, uh, volume seven of the uh, Bible commentary, uh, 957 says, the sin of the Nicolaitans and is it is it our sin, the sin of the Nicolaitans, is turning grace of God into lasciviousness. So that was ma the main portion because they were very, there was a lot of, of sexual immorality at that time. So they, they used God's grace <clears throat> to give themselves permission to do things they shouldn't. That, Huh? Can you imagine being up on a moment? It's okay to participate in the pagan orgy. God will forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was quite that bold, but there were some nuances of it. There. The, the doctrine is now largely taught that the gospel of Christ was made the law of God of no effect. That by believing, we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. But this is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Christ so unsparingly condemned. The Gnosticism, which was, is also what, what, it, what they could have believed, which is very similar to what we just read. The material world is bad. The spiritual world is good. The material world it undergoes evil control, ignorance, and nothingness. A spark, a divine spark, is somehow trapped in some, but not all. Humans, and it alone, of all that exists in the material world is capable of redemption. Salvation is through a secret knowledge by which individuals come to know themselves, their origins and their destiny. This secret knowledge, what does that remind you of? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, say it. <laughs> new age. It's on it's all new age. Yeah. It is. It's all new age, at least. Yeah, it's all new age. So what I'm what we're what we're seeing here, remember King Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun? They just repackage it. And, and, and sell it to us. To have secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's no secret knowledge to tell me. Mm -mm. God fills it out. What is secret to God? There's no secret to God. Yeah. Since a good God could not have created an evil world, it must have been be created by an inferior, ignorant, ignorant or evil God. <clears throat> so Revelation 2 7 says, Him that has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of par the paradise of God. One of the things I want to mention here, on this, this piece where it says, to him that has an ear, let him hear. Hearing is a verb. It's not just 
taking it in and letting it sit here <laughs> somewhere. It means taking it in and putting it to use. So if God says, hear what I'm telling you, it means making a change in your life. It, may, it means going out and doing something for him. It's not just absorbing knowledge, it's, but it's, it's supposed to have a transforming effect on our lives. <laughs> so the overcomers, the ones who heed Christ's counsel in Ephesus, were promised to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Remember after Adam and Eve sinned, they were forbidden to eat from the tree of life. Now those in Ephesus who stayed faithful do not participate in pagan practices will be allowed to eat from the tree restored in even Eden. Revelation 22, 2 says, in the midst of the street, it will be on either side of the river. There will be a tree of life, which bear 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. <clears throat> so the fruit was good to eat. And the, he the, the leaves do what? <laughs> This wasn't that the same thing in Eden? No. Yeah. Uh, the tree of life was good for food, which they ate, and the leaves were for healing. Jesus appeals to the church with three imperatives to these the Ephesians. Keep, it, keep remembering, repent, and do your first work. So first, the Ephesians must keep remembering, as the Greek text indicates, they had not forgotten the relationship they once had with Christ, but failed to continue in it. By recalling the ardent love for Christ and each other that flowed from their hearts, they accepted the gospel. The members would realize their present spiritual condition. Two, then they should repent. Repentance in the Bible denotes a radical turnaround in one's life. Repenting isn't just going to God and saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, over and over again. True repentance is going to God and saying, I'm ready to make a change in my life, and then making that change in life. So <clears throat> Jesus called the Ephesians to turn away from their present condition and turn back to God. And finally, the Ephesians must start doing their first works. Jesus does not urge them to love to the determinant of doing right, the revitalization of their first love, which is for Christ, will result in right doing. So he's telling us, telling them, come back to me first, and then everything will fall into place. The Christians in Ephesus return to their first devotion to Christ, love for fellow humans will follow in their midst. <laughs> the situation of the church of Ephesus corresponds aptly with the situation and spiritual condition of the church in general in the first century. The first century was a period characterized by love and faithfulness to the gospel. By the time John wrote the book of Revelation, the church had begun losing the fire of its first love, thus departing from the simplicity and purity of the gospel. So <clears throat> Ephesus had a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. Then comes the church of Smyrna. And the church of Smyrna, and this is a principle that's interesting, and I've watched it over my many years of living. But when you see God going to work at a place and you see the Holy Spirit and you see souls being saved, it isn't long before Satan comes to try to destroy that. And he will try to destroy that with all kinds of persecution. And this is what we see happening to Smyrna. So would somebody like to read for me uh, Revelation 2, 8 through 11? And those scriptures are on. All right, I'll read them to you. Go ahead. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, these things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. All oh. What a description of God. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy, blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and thy not, but are the synagogue of Satan. 
Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried, and he shall have tribulation ten days, and be thou fulfilled unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Verse 11. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. There's a lot to unpack in this, Absolutely. isn't there? So what do we know about Smyrna? Smyrna was another important city located next to Ephesus. Correct. Its geographic location earned its reputation of having the most convenient and safest harbor of any trade city in Asia. Yeah. So here we are, another harbor, another harbor city. And the reason for that is why? Trade and a lot of interaction with other population. Yeah, a lot of people visited, right. visited the city. It's geographical. Okay, I already said that. The city also stood on the major crossroads of Phrygia and Lydia right. that made it an important trade route connecting Greece and Asia. So that was that was big. Its location, the trade, the fertile area made Smyrna a very wealthy city with a population of some 200,000 residents. So the other one, the other had 250,000. Now we have 200,000. So it was a very populated city. The city was also a political, religious, cultural center. It was proud of its famous stadium library and the largest public theater in the province, which was seat which seated twenty thousand people. So that's huge. That's how they knew it was two hundred thousand because the theater always had a whole ten percent of the population. Mm -hmm. You know, Barbara. That theater is not far away from the sea. And when you're in the center of the, the theater and you speak, you may be right on the out, outskirts of, of the, the theater. You can hear it perfectly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 That was a remarkable experience to see. So, because of its wealth and exceptional beauty, the city claimed to be the glory of Asia. It was also noted for the science and medicine industries that flourished there. The city proudly claimed to be the birthplace of the famous epic poet Homer. The Roman Senate granted the city the privilege to build a temple in honor of Tiberius. This made Smyrna a center of emperor worship. Late in the first century and after, emperor worship became compulsory for all citizens. So they, they made it, they had to, if you had to, uh, there was no choice. As an act of loyalty, it was a civic duty for all citizens to go to the temple once a year and burn incense before the statue of the emperor and proclaim Caesar is Lord. Yep. So you can imagine what that did for the Christians. Those who did this would receive a certificate allowing them to hold a job or conduct business. Yeah. Those who refused to comply were faced with persecution. Or well, you're literally considered it was treasonous to not do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Bible commentary tells us a little bit more about this. Um, the climate is was pleasant and with and has profuse vegetation, which adds charm to the scenery. <laughs> there were olive, cypress, fig, pomegranate. And plane trees. Now, plane trees are those kinds of trees that have scaly bark on them. You've seen trees that where the bark kind of curls up. It was the, it, those kind of trees were plane trees. And even the date palm. The chief products of export um, today are their famous figs, tobacco, silk, and the well-known carpets. Minerals found in the mountains of Smyrna region and since ancient times include iron, manganese, gold, silver, mercury, lead, copper, and antimony. Now, antimony 
is a mineral that you see in flame retardants, paints, plastics, rubbers, and different textiles. So it was, it was well used. Some soft coal was mined in the region. Anciently, other attractions of Smyrna was its warm springs, which were frequented by people suffering from arthritis. Taken internally, the waters were said to relieve intestinal troubles. Wow. So, Alexander the Great founded that city, I think, didn't I don't remember who founded it. The Christian community in, in Smyrna has experienced numerous and several periods of persecution. It is of interest to note that since ancient times, the name Smyrna has been interpreted to mean myrrh, a bitter but aromatic gum resin obtained from East Africa and Arabia, symbolizing bitterness and suffering. <laughs> Modern scholars discredit this traditional interpretation in favor of a derivative. Der 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 yeah, that word. <laughs> of Samorna, the name of an Anatolian goddess who worshipped in the city. Whatever the true interpretation of the city's name, it is a historical fact that Christians of Smyrna have seen more suffering than those of any other city in the region. So they were, they, this, this city had just so much persecution, more so than any of the other the other <clears throat> cities, even though they all the cities had some, this this one received the most. The Christian community of Smyrna also suffered repeated persecutions ever since John's time, and was as famous martyrs have laid down their lives within the walls of the city. Doubtless, the most illustrious of those was Polycarp, and who was Polycarp? He, he was, was a bishop of the church, of the leader. And they thought by killing him, they could snuff out the Christians. Yeah. They burned him alive. He was a martyr. And he was um, He was a disciple of John. Disciple of John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was burned alive in 155 AD, either in the stadium or a great theater. Mm -hmm. Both being pointed out as the place where he met his death. Every They both wanted to take credit for it. Mm -hmm. Yet his death and the deaths of other valiant martyrs brought much fruit during the ensuing decades right. and centuries. Smyrna became one of the strongest centers of Christianity in the eastern half of the Roman Empire and was the last city of Asia Minor to yield to the Muslim conquest. Mm -hmm. Until World War I, uh, four out of every five inhabitants were Christian, yet the city finally succumbed to the Muslim invasion in 1922. Right. So this city, in spite of all of its persecution, stayed true to God the longest. And it's Muslim, is that Muslim? Yeah. Only exists back then. Nineteen twenty-two. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus introduces himself to the church in Smyrna as the first and the last. What does that mean? I was the first and the last. <laughs> Everything. Yes, yeah. I was alive, was dead. and then I was dead, and then I came to life. Revelation 2 8 says, And the angel said unto the church of Smyrna, Write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. So, what's Christ saying here to the church of Smyrna? He's saying that, look, I died for you, but God resurrected me as an example. If you die for me, I will resurrect you. I'll give you that step and I'll that kind of victory. So what is he giving them? He's giving them hope, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. He's, he's giving them hope. <clears throat> These characteristics, characteristics, Jesus corresponded aptly with their situation. The members were going through the hardships of persecution, anticipating an even more severe persecution, Jesus comes to them as the one who understands their situation because he was also persecuted to the point of death. And he would be with them in their trials. That's one of the things that's important in this message to Smyrna. You're not in this alone. I am, I am here with you. So first, Jesus knows their affliction. <clears throat> the Greek word for affliction is here denotes 
pressure of a burden that crushes. So he noticed, he knows how difficult that pressure is. Second, they are in extreme poverty and destitute, they possess nothing. Their poverty is related to the persecution they're experiencing. Because of their loyalty to Christ, many church members were ostracized and lost their jobs while some suffered imprisonment and even death. However, in spite of their poverty and material goods, the S S Smyrna, uh, Smyr Smyrnian were rich in grace and faith, which is completely opposite of what we're gonna see with of the Laodiceans. So even though <clears throat> they were sorely persecuted, they were able to cling to Jesus with that with the faith. Jesus also mentions malignant slander from the Jews that contributed significantly to their plight. The Jews in the Roman Empire were usually exempted from worshiping the emperor and pagan gods. Isn't that interesting? The Jews didn't have to do it. However, toward the end of the first century, the Jews in found themselves in a difficult situation with the officials. Since Romans often identified early Christians with Jews, because a lot of the early Christians were Jews at one time, right. Jews wanted to disassociate themselves from the Christian. They slandered the Christians before the local officials by making malicious accusations and inciting authorities to persecute them. Although they considered themselves to be the synagogue of God, these Jews actually constitute did the synagogue of Satan by being used by Satan to harm God's people. Right. And, and that, that really was part of the challenge that the church in Sperma was facing. Yeah. Jews against Jews, Christians against Jews, Jews and other people. Yeah. To the Romans, all you have to realize when they conquered the Jews, right? They'd already had an established religion for literally you know a good thousand years plus. Mm -hmm. To them, that was established. That was something. To the Christians, this new, they just thought it was a form of madness. They hadn't seen it as an step. Religion was something that was older, that was entrenched. This is just a fad that they had. So like, this can't be real. So that's why they didn't treat them the same. Though. Yeah. So Jesus recognizes this plight. In Revelation 9 and 10, he says, I know thy works and the tribu and tribulation and poverty but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews, but are the synagogue of Satan. So we see that these Jews who were at one time <clears throat> loyal followers of God were now persecuting the followers of God. So he said, but Christ says, don't fear those things which you suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So that one thing, Jesus say, uh, but thou art rich. Thou art rich. Who are they? Are they Jews or are they Gentiles? No, it's the Christians. I know, it's the Christians. <clears throat> are they part of the Jews? No. And some Jews people? Well, so there's some Jews come from Martin. Yeah, there were Jews who converted to Christianity. But, um, there's but there's unless, unless they accepted Christ, they weren't God's. God's people. Remember, we talked about richness in faith. Yeah, I know. I'm so, I'm, I got it. Because when God says that you're rich in faith, that's amazing. What I'm saying is, is the Jew is, is the synagogue of Satan. Right, mm -hmm. So these are Jews that don't believe that Christ is God. Right. right. Yeah. But there are some in the rich faith. There are mm -hmm. some no, Jews no, there. No, no. They're in faith they in say faith. they're Jews. They just say they're Jews. They're not. They're the synagogue of Satan. They may say they're Jews, but they're not. But they're probably, like Daniel said, they're probably the first Jews. No, these are Jews that wanted to throw the Christians under the law. Yeah, these like, are the ones who, who came after the Christians. Yeah, remember to them, it's that weird sect of Judaism that needs to be done away with, kind of like right. all these Jews. So there's no Jews, right? Jews there? No, it doesn't seem like it. So the Christians in Smyrna were in constant fear for their future. Jesus gently admonishes them to stop fearing. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And we see that in John 1, 418. 
but they were about to experience even more serious trials and imprisonment in a, in a period of 10 days, like the 10 days of testing Daniel assigned for him and his friends in Babylon. So remember that story? <clears throat> Daniel, um, they, they wanted Daniel to eat what he wasn't supposed to eat. And he went to, he went and said, no, let me just eat pulse and water, vegetables and water. And when he tested them, what happened with the, with this? What happened? They were better, weren't they? Days, though, and for smear, that was symbolically ten years, though, right? <clears throat> yeah. Right. With yeah, with, right. Yeah, with Diocletian. Right. Yeah. I don't want to steal your thunder. That's all right. <laughs> so they were tested for ten days, and they turned out better, and their features were better because they didn't succumb. So it was it was a test. However, Jesus urges them to remain faithful even to the point of death, and he will give them a crown of life. So this crown that they're talking about here <coughs> refers to the garland of the Olympic Games. Remember the winner of the Olympic Games got to wear this That's crown? A laurel leaf thing. It's a laurel leaf thing. But it was given to to the the winners, and so everyone and that was a very coveted crown that we in the in the Olympic Games, and so he's telling them, overcome and you'll get one of those get get one of those. It won't just be for one; it will be for everyone who overcomes. And the crown that Jesus promises the faithful in Samaria is eternal life to be given at his second coming. Coming. 2 Timothy 4, 8, finally there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me to that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. James stated, blessed is a man who preserves under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised mm -hmm. to those who love him. We see that in James one twelve. So the overcomers in Smyrna were given the promise that they would not be hurt by the second death. Physical death is a temporary sleep in which, as such, is not a tragedy because of the hope of the resurrection. It is a second death that should be feared, eternal death, from which there will be no resurrection. Jesus warned his followers, do not fear those who kill the body, but who are unable to kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. So our bodies are just a temporary shell for now. So the experience of the Church of Smyrna coincided through severe persecution. The Christians throughout the empire during the second and third centuries, 10 days in Revelation 2.10 mentioned in this message could be applied prophetically to the notorious imperial persecution in the, initiated by the emperor Diocletian and continued under his successor Galerius and it was from 3003 to 313. <clears throat> so that was 10 years, huh? You said 3003, 303. Sorry. I know you're testing, I'm listening. <laughs> it's all right, that's why I have it up here so you guys can keep me on track, right? <laughs> in this way, the Church of Smyrna could represent the period in the church history from the beginning of the second century until approximately 313, when Quentin the Great issued his famous right. Edict of Milan, right. granting Christians religious freedom. Right. From the Bible commentary, we can see here that there were a number of, of times of affliction under Trajan, right. Heredian, Marcus Aurelius, and it, was, it would be sporadic and localized. Um, but the general Chris, uh, uh, persecution was under um, Decius, Valerian, and political oppression reached its bloody climax under Diocletian and his immediate successor. Historically, the period represented by the Smyrna Church will be called the Age of Martyrdom. The centuries since have been fragrant with the love and the devotion 
of thousands of unnamed martyrs of this period who were faithful unto death. <clears throat> no wonder later in Revelation, the martyrs are crying out, God, how much longer is this going to go on? Mm -hmm. So the next, uh, the last church we're going to talk about tonight is Pergamus. And Pergamus is an interesting church because it really is the church where we start getting into compromise, right. uh, religious compromise. And you'll see the next it was a beautiful setting, wasn't it? <clears throat> there, the ruins overlooked the sea. <laughs> but the next one, I wish I could have found something like this for all of the churches, but I only found this for, for Pergamum. But it shows some interesting layout of this. The, <laughs> the different temples, we see a, a, a huge library. The temple, the Athena temple, the temple of Zeus, or the altar of Zeus over here, and then the Zeus temple down here, and the huge theater. They love their theaters. Right. The theaters were big. <clears throat> so we see that these cities <clears throat> pretty much have everything we have today. We don't see a whole lot of different different things today that they have that they had then. Now, what's interesting about this library is that this, this library in Pergamos was infamous. In fact, it was so, uh, it rivaled uh, the library in Alexandria. Yeah, correct. And Ptolemy got so jealous of this huge library that he put an embargo on paper yeah. so they couldn't <laughs> continue. <clears throat> to grow the library. And then what's interesting, oh, don't put that. No. That's oh. my notes. <laughs> Good, yeah. You're going you're gonna to watch my notes. You have to remember that the most of the people was about papyrus. Animal parchments were hard to come by, but yeah. the papyrus. So when you cut them off, you literally strangled their writing ability. Yeah. yeah. So what's interesting about this is Mark, Mark Anthony later removes the library and gives it to Cleopatra as a gift. So you see these, later we're going to talk about kings of the north and kings of the south, but how they would come after each other and pillage and, and take what they needed. So who wants to read Revelation 2, 12 through 17? I need a loud voice. Okay. And the angel of the church and the cardinals, right, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan seeth, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where, sweet, or where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, uh, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. I haven't spent that much old English in. I know you guys are getting the King James in here. So I personally like King James for prophecy. I use New King James for most everything else, but when I'm with prophecy, I like the like the King James version. So anyway, the city of Pergamum served as the capital city of Asia for more than two and a half centuries, which is so the capital moved around a little bit, didn't it? Although this honor was also claimed by Ephesus, in addition to its political importance, <clears throat> Pergamum was repute, a repute, the reputed center of intellectual life 
in the Hellenistic world. Its famous library of nearly 2,000 volumes were second largest library after Alexandria. The city was the home of Gallian, the famous physician in ancient world who studied there at the medical school of Asclepius. Now, who was Asclepius? Does anybody know who Asclepius was? He was the father of modern medicine. Oh, modern medicine. Modern medicine. Uh-huh. So take a look at this. So Asclepius, Apollo was his father, and his uh and as a favor or of some kindness rendered by Asclepius, a snake licked Asclepius's ears clean and taught him secret knowledge. I was <laughs> Huh? That's what's lovely. Yeah. The snake is a symbol of the devil. <clears throat> the devil would lick your ears, please. <laughs> and, and teach you all kinds of secret <laughs> knowledge. How Satan Yeah. Yeah. To the Greeks, yeah, to the Greeks, snakes were sacred beings, wisdom, healing, and resurrection. So we see that this is Asclepius. In fact, it's interesting because the way I learned about Asclepius, and I grew up in healthcare, as most of you know, right. one of the hospitals I worked at, they named it Asclepius for a while because that was the father of modern medicine. I wonder if you know that the snake serpent <laughs> in Garden of Eden it has to do with that. They've been using... Snake is the source of wisdom and healing. I know. I'm not going to get into this because I have my opinions. If you want to ask me privately about my opinions, I'll be happy to tell you. But some of you will think I am like off my rocker. So <laughs> we need to move on. <laughs> You're ready? We're ready to rock. Okay, let's move on. Pergamon was also a reputed religious center. It was the first city in Asia to embrace emperor worship. This emperor worship was really big. big. <laughs> the Romans were big in emperor worship. It all started with the gospel. Yeah. Well, and there was a large temple to him there in Pergamos. As in Smyrna, emperor worship was compulsory in Pergamon. To secure the certificate allowing them to work and to run a business, the citizens were obliged to offer incense to the statue of the emperor and proclaim Caesar as Lord. So <clears throat> not only did they have to do this back in Smyrna, but they had to do it here as well. I'm sure they had to do it in all the cities where there was emperor worship. A refusal to do so would result losing one's legal status and facing persecution. The city was also famed for its magnificent temples to Zeus, Athena, Dionysus, and Asclepius. So they had a temple to this, this god of healing, Asclepios, <clears throat> and also to Zeus. Who was Zeus? King of gods. Yeah. Zeus was a big king, wasn't yeah, he? He was it. <clears throat> he was the big king of the gods. On the Acropolis of the city stood remarkable altar of Zeus <clears throat> with the central portion of which now is exhibited in the Pergamum Museum. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment in Berlin. So they, they took the whole, the whole altar and moved it to Berlin. Now the city stood, now this, near the city stood an immense shrine of Asclepius, the great god of healing. Asclepius was called the savior. In John's time, the shrine of Asclepius experienced great popularity. People came from around the world to be healed by this savior god who made Pergamum the lords of province in Asia. How many people go to witch doctors? How many people <clears throat> go to faith healers thinking that somehow they're going to be healed? Something to think about. All things created a different situation for the Christians in Pergamum. They were surrounded by paganism in its splendid temples. They lived in cl a climate hostile to their faith. They consistently wish, witness smoke arising from the altar of Zeus located above the city and dominating the whole area. 
They could hear stories of the miraculous healings at, at the Asclepian Healing Center, named after Asclepius. Circulating at the time when miracles were fading in their midst, these things made the city a place where Satan dwells and where his throne was located. So in the next slide, we will see this is the, <clears throat> the seat of Satan. Yeah. the altar of Zeus yeah. and we have seen this uh, mirrored and built in different ways in different places around the world since then they have mirrored this for presidential uh, swearing ins and for all kinds of things uh, throughout time so it's 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 really kind of an, an interesting thing so then the next slide is a picture of where the temple was, was or the yeah. seat of Satan was. What do we know always about pagan temples and pagan sites? They're, on top of the They're always in high places, aren't they? Right. And so here we see this above everything in the city. Yes. So this, this <laughs> temple was in the high place. So let's go on to the next. Jesus identifies himself to the Christians in Pergamum as the one with the sharp two-edged sword. The Roman emperor in Pergamum, Hadius Galati, the, the, right the, the right of the sword. So the Roman emperor had the right of the sword. He had the right to kill whoever he wanted to kill. That is the power to put whoever he wanted to to death. No doubt he used the power... Uh, this power against Christians. However, Jesus assured the church that the power over life and death belongs only to him. And we see that in Revelation uh, 1, 17 and 18. And Revelation 1, 17 and 18, uh, we have, we've already read that where he said he was dead and, and behold, I am alive forevermore and hold the keys of hell and of death. Humans might claim that power, but the last word belongs to Jesus. Amen. That's right. In the world, you may have tribulation, but be but take courage. I have overcome the world. And this next slide, before we read John 16:33, is a picture of the Roman gladius sword. I thought you might find that interesting. I thought it was kind of That's interesting. Cute. That's cute. <laughs> But see, they're two-edged swords with a pointy end. So they could do a lot of damage. Right. Those, sword, those swords could. Um, so we see in John 16, 33, we've already read that one. In John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have come Amen. overcome the world. Amen. So throughout the Bible, we see Christ giving this encouragement to people. Jesus said to the Christians of Pergamum that he knew they lived in a place that was antagonistic toward them. They lived in the city where Satan dwelt and where his throne was situated, namely at the very headquarters of Satan's activities. Yet most of them remained unwavering and their faithfulness to Christ. They were ostracized in society for not condoning emperor worship and for not respecting pagan gods and practices. Some of them paid for their faithful, faithfulness to Christ. Antipas, a prominent Christian, was put to death by the Roman governor because of his total loyalty to Christ. So Antipas was killed in Pergamon. No doubt he used that power against Christians. However, Jesus assures the church that the power over life and death belongs to him. And we've read that in John 16, 33 as well. They lived in the city where Satan dwelt and where the throne was situated, namely the very headquarters of Satan's activities. Yet most of them remained unwavering in their face to Christ. They were ostracized in society for not condoning emperor worship and not respecting the pagan practices. 
Some of them paid for their faithfulness to Christ. And I've said, read that already about Antipas, mm -hmm. who has died. Um, not all Christians in Pergamum remained faithful, though. There were some who compromised their Christianity with pagan practices. So they belonged to camps. The Nicolaitans, and who we talked about earlier, remember the Nicolaitans we, we just read about, <clears throat> and the teachings of Balaam. And in Revelation 2, 14 and 15, we see, we read this. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there, because thou hast there are them, there are them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Yeah. So they held the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So cast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. So the fact that Jesus mentions these two groups together suggests they are related. Right. What do we remember about, <coughs> excuse me, Balaam? He, he was hired to, to curse the Israelites, but then he could not because God wouldn't let him. But at the end, he decided to help uh, Balaam by sending the women in the camp, and then they started being a and Yeah, he really is a commission to subdue. The word is seduce. Yeah. The Israelites to, to have a relationship with the Moabites. Yeah. What it, it Balaam's an interesting character because he was a prophet. He he was supposed to be a prophet. Yeah. And Balak actually was paying him to try to get control over the Israelites. That's correct. And so Balaam was more than happy to do this. And I think three times. He tried to, 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 to curse right. the Israelites, and God wouldn't let him. <laughs> God says, uh-uh, it's not going to happen. But he realized and he thought, I'm off the trick. If you get them separated from God, then their protection is gone. Yeah. And then you can do whatever you want with them. God is their power. Yeah. So he, at one point in time, he even took his, he, he started beating on his donkey sure. because the donkey wouldn't let him through. And the donkey spoke to him and said, why are you beating me? Sure. And then the angel appeared to Balaam and said, I was going to kill you. So thank your donkey. Stop beating him. Thank him. Thank him for saving you. So this is how, this is how this guy was really intent on destroying God's people. Really and in the end he that. did. And how did he do it? Through lust of the flesh, right. and and through uh, these Midianite women, so Moabite. Moabite. Oh, did I say Midianite? Moabite. Thank you, Moabite women. Who practice idolatry, and that that's really how it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, Balaam and Nicholas, the names in Hebrew and Greek respectively, both meaning the one who conquers the nations. What? Just, <coughs> huh? So, yeah. <clears throat> Where was I? Ba actually, Balaam and Nicholas are names in Hebrew and Greek, respectively, both meaning the one who conquers nations. Right. So, this Nicolaitan and Balaam were ones who have destroyed nations by false teachings and um, and lustful behaviors. Just as Balaam seduced the Israelites on the way to the promised land to engage in illicit relationships with the Moabite women and practice idolatry, these people encouraged their fellow Christians to avoid persecution and compromise with regard to emperor worship and participation in pagan social religious activities. Now, <clears throat> these pagan activities in these pagan temples usually involved orgies. Um, there, was, there was usually a sexual practice that went with right. these. Right. Well, the church in Ephesus strongly resisted the teachings of these false teachers. These teachers clearly won some adherence among Pergamum. 
And Numbers uh, 3116 said about Balaam, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the council to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague upon the congregation of the Lord. So they, <laughs> thanks to his doings, they even were able to, um, to endure a plague of God, because of God's wrath. Jesus encourages the church not to compromise with pagan religious practices. He exhorts them to repent. If they do not repent and turn from their course of action, judgment is imminent. Christ is coming to wage war against them with the sword of his mouth. And we saw that, an example of that two-edged sword. Just as Balaam, along with those whom he had seduced into sin, was killed, and we saw that in Numbers 31.8, they slew the kings of Midian besides the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, Rechem, Zor, Gor, and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam, also the son of Beor, slew with the sword. A similar judgment will be visited on the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans. The only way to avoid the impending judgment is to repent and make a decisive turnaround in their relationship with Christ. The overcomers in Pergamum who refused to participate in pagan practices were promised the privileges of eating the hidden manna. Now we're going to talk about some of these things like hidden manna, white stones, and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, we see in um, this, this eating the hidden manna or the bread of angels in Psalm 78, 25. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. Because of their refusal to participate in emperor worship, they were deprived of the certificate with their names on it. It, issued, it was issued by the Roman governor. However, Jesus promised them a white stone with a new name engraved and titled them to special privileges that surpassed any pleasures in life. So let's go back to this hidden manna for a second. <clears throat> The SDA Bible commentary says what it says about hidden manna. It talks about um, Exodus 16, uh, 33 here. Some think the allusion here may be the manna Aaron placed in the pot preserved in the ark. Mm -hmm. And 1633 on the next slide says, and Moses said to Aaron, <laughs> excuse me, take a pot and put an omer. Now, do we know how much an omer is? It's about 43 ounces. Full of manna therein and lay it before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Now, what was kept in the Ark of the Covenant? Uh, Aaron's bod. Mm -hmm. It's bod. Yeah, no. it's yeah, the budded rod of Aaron. The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. And the manna. And the manna. Those were the three things that were put into exactly. the ark. And how many, many <laughs> Yeah. So that was put in uh, put into the ark. Um, and also Hebrews 9, 4 says, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid around with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So we see those things, three things were put in the ark. And that's significant. <laughs> because what did the manna do? It sustained them. It sustained them, didn't it? It sustained, it sustained them through their whole God, journey. God is the source of our, whatever we need to, from well we live. Yeah. So, so God is the source, isn't he? An ancient Jewish teaching declares that when the Messiah would come, the treasury of manna shall again descend on high, and they will eat of it for those years. And that comes from um, the Apocrypha. In view of John uh, 6, 31, it seems that John here intends manna to be symbolic of spiritual life in Christ 
and eternal life in the hereafter. So we're going to, let's read the whole John 31 through 34. Somebody want to read that for me? Our fathers came to man out in the desert as it is written, who gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Yeah. And then Christ says something in Matthew 4, 4, what? Man shall not live by what? Bread alone. Bread alone, but by every word that saves from the God. So we see this bread and this manna as being the whole picture of God's sustenance of his people. Go ahead. In significance uh, for us to understand that the Christians in, 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 this, in, in, in this church that were entitled to the manna were undocumented Christians. <laughs> undocumented citizens, that's what it meant. Yeah. They were undocumented. How significant that is that in order for them to survive, they deprived themselves of the rights that they they could have as being a citizen of a Roman citizen. Yeah. And and we have no idea what that really meant. And I'm making this statement, Barbara, because the time is going to come where when we will be able not to buy or sell. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the undocumentation of faith of Christian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But God, God, God sustained these people. Yeah. He really did. He sustained them. Because of their refusal to participate in emperor worship, they were deprived of a certificate. You just said that. However, Jesus promises them a white stone with a new name engraved on it, yeah. entitling them to special privileges that surpasses the pleasure of the pa of pagan life. Right, eternal life with him. And so we look at what could this white stone be? <laughs> now, stones were used a lot. In the Old Testament, if you, if, if you, and even today, if you travel like uh, when, I, when we were in Jordan, you know, we visited Jordan, you would see altars of rocks mm -hmm. in different places, and they were used as a very strongly as a communication tool. But uh, the SEI Bible commentary says various ancient customs have been suggested as providing a basis for this allusion to gift to the gift of a white stone. But none of these is altogether satisfactory. Mm -hmm. One of the more common ancient customs is that the use of a white stone and a black stone by jurors to determine acquittal or conviction. Right. So right. if they were acquitted, they got a white stone. Right. If they were convicted, right. they got a black stone. <laughs> and um, that may be said to be the reason, reasonable certainty that John used that John doubtless refers to some ceremony right. involving the bestowal of a special gift. Yeah. So it will have their name on it. And I'm sure John, through his travels, had an opportunity to see the whites and the black stones as he, right. as he got himself into all kinds of situations. So that's the white stone, huh? He went to trial a few times. Yeah. Is the white stone uh, physically there? Yeah, physically. If 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 there was a uh, if if you were on trial and you received a white stone, you could go free. Not guilty. Okay. If you received a black stone, guilty. you were guilty. So the white stone meant freedom. So the white stone means with a heaven. Name on it. With a name on it, meant means would mean heaven. Yeah. Is what is what the the representation could symbolize. It's a great yeah um so let's talk now about the new name and we're going to see this new name used quite frequently in the bible <laughs> in the bible the person's name often stands for his character and a new name would indicate a new character there the new is not patterned after the old 
but replaces it and is different from it. Here the Christian is promised a new name, that is a new and different character pattern after that of God. No man knoweth the experience of spiritual rebirth, of transformation of character can be understood only by personal experience. Attempts to explain this experience to a man who himself has not been born again can never convey a true or complete picture of it. So each one of us, when we come to God, our character changes, doesn't it? Because the things we like to do once, we don't want to do anymore. We become transformed and changed into his likeness. So let's look at a couple of scriptures here that talk about this new name. <clears throat> and this is a famous one who got a new name. Neither shall my name be in Genesis 17, 5. Neither shall my name anymore be called Abraham, Abram. But now my name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations I have made thee. So God changes Abram's name to Abraham. So we see this new name concept here. Genesis uh, 32, 28. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. <laughs> so we see God changing, giving them a new name. In Isaiah 66, 2, and the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, all the kings of thy glory, and thou shalt be called a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. So God gives the, them a new, give, gives um, his children a new name here we see in Isaiah. Also is Isaiah 65, 15. And ye shall leave your name for a curse to my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. So <clears throat> he's actually talking about letting Israel go and giving a different name. So didn't, didn't, didn't his people go from being Israelites to Christians? Yeah. Isn't that what happened? And Revelation 3.12, He that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And so that is a promise here to these uh folks in Pergamum. And John 3, 5, 3, 8, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I said unto thee, you must be born again. So this born again concept is also a new name concept. Yeah. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it come, and whether it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. <clears throat> so our last slide here. <clears throat> the situation in the Church of Pergamum represents the situation of the Christian church at large during the period following the conversion of Constantine the Great to Christianity in 313. Right. As the church finally won its struggle with paganism, the Christians no longer had to fear persecution or pressure from outside. However, many in the church chose to compromise Christianity and paganism. So we see this happening is Christianity and paganism start merging. This merging um, brings a whole different complexion to Christianity or what they call Christianity. And Paul wrote the letter to the church to remind them, to, to tell them this is where come from. Yeah. So paganism, pagan philosophical ideas and customs made their way into the church, gradually replacing the Bible as a source of teaching and belief. Although many Christians remain unwavering and unfaithful and faithful to the gospel during this period, and the third and fourth and fifth. There should be a period at the end of that. I'm sorry. So 
So we see that each of these churches have really struggled. Right. And so let's just grab here our little sheets for review. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so the, the Ephesus was the first church. So it was about the first century. We see that right. approximation. What was the meaning of the name? First or desirable. So what was the what was their warning? Don't earn your don't don't lose your first love. Yeah, if you guys have if you guys have your your sheet, did you get one of these? Yeah, everybody got it. We're going. That's what we're going through. So it'll help you answer the questions. So what was the name given to Jesus in there? He had seven stars in his right hand, and he walked as where? Yeah. What was the their commendations? Yeah. And and that was one. That was one of the things that was really important in this first century church. They didn't put up with false teachers. Right. And. Uh, we see in Laodicea a lot of false teachers. Right. They what was their reproof? They, they left their first love, didn't they? And what did they say? What did, what was their counsel? <laughs> but what is their promise if they repent? They will eat the tree of life. They get the tree of life. You know, it's also true, Barbara, that during this particular period was the greatest evangelistic um, activity in the world. Yeah. In, in a period of 70, 80 years, the world got to know of Jesus Christ. It's just amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Primarily through the disciples of the Christians. Yeah. Yeah. And so with myrrh, what do we see with myrrh? What was the main feature of the time period? Smyrna. 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 What did I say? Smear? Myrrh. Myrrh. Smyrna. Smyrna. I'm reading myrrh, the sweet fragrance. So Smyrna, what was their, what was their, what was the biggest issue with their time period? They were persecuted. Persecuted, suffering, and martyr. Yeah. And what was the name given to Jesus? The yeah. And what was what was good about this church? Their commendations. Yeah. What was their reproof? None. None. There's only there's only two churches that had had. Ah, uh, no reproof. That's right. funny because one was pretty good and the other one was second to last. <laughs> so which church is this? Africa is the the African to which church? Symbolic to which church? I mean, which time? Well, the time period was from 100 to about 325 AD. Now remember that, like uh, the church of Theotira, it was like the big the. Uh, me, uh, doing the, like, yeah, the, Thyatira we'll get to next week. That was that was the Dark Ages, and we'll we'll spend a bit of time on that. Um, <clears throat> so God told them their counsel was to be faithful, and they would receive what the crown of life, yeah. and they wouldn't be hurt in the second death. Yeah, be faithful unto death. I love that one. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. And then Pergamus. What does that mean? What is what is the meaning of the name? Interesting. It's a really steep hill to get up there. <laughs> the high places they had up there. <laughs> and what was the main feature of this this uh, this time period? It was compromise, wasn't it? They compromised with the pagan religions. And, and Constantine had a lot to do with that yeah. because he, 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 he professes to convert into Christianity, which never really happened, but he professed to do that. He brings the Christians and the sun worshippers together into a culture, a governance, and an economy. 
And you know, when you do that, then you begin to uh, to mix and to mingle. Yeah. So we got Jesus. Well, remember how remember how Constantine converted. Yeah. Do we remember how Constantine converted? He had a vision. He was going to battle, yeah. and he had a vision. And he took all his soldiers with him. And he had a vision that if he and he saw a cross, he saw the cross in the sun. Was up the sun with a behind the cross, and it, and a voice said to him, "If you fight under this banner, you'll win." So he decided he would become a Christian at that moment in time, and he took all of his pagan soldiers, who lifted their swords above their head, walked through the river, to the river, walked through the river. He baptized them. They That's actually, that was their baptism. They actually did that with the They were on horse. Through the waters, and that was their baptism. And, and so they came out the other side, Christians, and they won the war. Well, except for the arm that wasn't baptized, with the sword would still kill people. Be okay. <laughs> but but the the truth of the matter is, when you do that, you you don't become Christians. All you have is a bunch of wet pagans. <laughs> so, and that's how they really came out on the other side. Exactly. We're just wet pagans. <laughs> and so <laughs> it smelled good. <laughs> well, hopefully they took a bar of soap with them. It smelled better. Didn't it? But they did win. And that's when Constantine changed his whole way of being. And his mother actually spent a lot of time going and collecting religious artifacts. Well, that's correct. His mother did that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and um, <clears throat> and, and and, and really, to a certain extent, the mother was extremely influential in providing a certain amount of, of dignity to the emperor. Yeah. yeah. She, she really did. But, but he, never, he, he never really converted into Christianity. He just, he just decided to mix them. Okay, and we're going to end this with, what was their reward? The hidden manna and a new name. So we've gone through the first of uh, first three of the last of the seven churches. So next week we'll do the last four. And uh, you guys can give me hints and points of what worked for you and what didn't work for you. Um, um, it was very good, Barbara, and the documentation was excellent. Yes. I really Were you able to follow it okay? That was my concern because one of the complaints I had gotten before that it was a little bit difficult to follow sometimes. So, a lot of information was well organized. Yeah. A lot of information. The was the beginning of the second century until approximately. Well, we're going to talk about what happened. We will be talking about 538 AD much more as we go through Revelation, but it was a, it was really a pivotal time for Rome. No, what I'm saying is there is a church expected there's no mistake. Well, no mistake. Well, I think there's been heretics in there to begin. Remember those seven deacons, right? Like, like, um, Stephen was the best of them, but Nicholas was the worst because he was the one who was teaching. That's what the Nicolaitans came from. Correct. And we have to remember this battle. By the time, by the time this this time period had come, Satan had had four thousand years to figure out how to discourage God's people and how to take God's people away from God. And he he did that with. The Israelites throughout time, and so he 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 doesn't really change. He uses the same philosophies. He uses the same uh, he he uses the techniques. techniques. That's the word. He uses the same techniques. So we just have to be wise. All right, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you uh, for this lesson tonight. Father, we thank you that we've been able to see these first three churches and father, how you've had your hand over them through time. In fact, if we learn, if we learn nothing more from revelation, it's that you are in charge, that right. this is truly about you. 
and how you have warned your people of the trials that they would see ahead, how they would be chased down by uh, false prophets, how they would um, how, how they would struggle through through the different problems in time, through the emperors, through through persecution and through everything that was thrown in front of them. And yet, Lord, you would be with them, that you would continue to sustain them, you would keep them going, that you would help them keep their first love, and you would give them the counsel that they needed just when they needed it. So, Father, tonight we want to thank you for this lesson. And we pray, Lord, as we go through this week, we'll be able to apply these principles that we'll be able to understand when truth is taught and when truth is not taught. And so, Father, we want to thank you for hearing our prayer and for being with us, for being our God, and for bringing us here tonight to study your word. We love you, Lord, and thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.